you ever been in your house during a scary storm? Lightning strikes nearby, and suddenly there's a crack, followed by a hot shaking roll of thunder, all the while the wind howling its threat to blow your house away. Storms are definitely mysterious, and even scary. Bible Sleuth here, and today we are chasing a mysterious, stormy adventure from Jesus' parables. Let's head out on the chase to find the storm in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. As always, there are questions. I'm wondering, if it has a connection to the parables of the salt and light. If you haven't seen that video, you ought to check it out. Anyway, I think I should look into the background of this story. There seems to be clues to this case that I'm missing. So, to set the stage, Jesus was teaching his famous Sermon on the Mount when he spoke these words and actually used this compare and contrast story to bring a visual to the sermon and maybe even a conclusion. To build any kind of structure, it has to start with a foundation. And in the case of this story, we see a wise and foolish builder who build their houses on different types of substrate. Let's look at the differences. So as far as foundations go, we know that building on solid rock is a best practice. Getting to bedrock and pouring a foundation will provide a much more stable footing and foundation in which to build a house or a building. In the case of buildings that are built to withstand extreme and violent conditions, engineers have to go to great lengths in order to allow for movement in these cases. For example, a skyscraper is subjected to high winds and ground shifts. You see, the bigger the building, the heavier, and the more science needed to be able to withstand those conditions. Some of the tallest buildings have footings that are well over 100 feet down into bedrock and then pylons are drilled into the bedrock. In some cases, the, a coil system is used in order to allow for movement, especially in areas prone to earthquakes. Regardless, it starts with the foundation, being connected to bedrock. So what is bedrock? Bedrock is a strata in the Earth's crust of solid rock and lays below upper soil. Bedrock is not subjected to expansion and contraction like topsoil. It doesn't sink, shift, or settle. So the question to ask in this parable is, what is he talking about when he's talking about rock? He seems to be comparing it to bedrock, but is there more? Also, what is Jesus talking about when he's talking about sand? Let's not forget that Jesus was connected to the trade of carpenter, which brings up another question. What kind of carpenter? Was he? So I took a virtual trip to the library and found several commentators arguing that Jesus was probably a stonemason by trade. In Matthew 13, Jesus was identified with Joseph as a son of the carpenter when Jesus visited his hometown. The townspeople found it hard to believe in him because of their familiarity with him and the family where the title came from. The Greek word used for carpenter was tekton, which could be translated as craftsman or builder. In the case of Bible times, buildings were primarily constructed out of stone, making it plausible that Jesus more closely was associated with stone masonry. To further support the notion of stone masonry, in Leviticus 1440, if a house was found to have mildew on the walls, the plaster was to be scraped and affected stones removed. 
This was spoken before Israel even stepped onto the promised land, which indicated the types of houses that they would be building. Regardless, Jesus' understanding of foundation building probably came from firsthand knowledge. The more I contemplate this parable, the more questions I am starting to have. Firstly, I want to say that I believe this parable actually is part of the parables of salt and light. All were told during his sermon on the mount, as I mentioned, and the first two gave an illustration of the gospel that painted a picture of the believer as the gospel. While the last one comes at the end of the message, kind of as a way to summarize and maybe even warn the believer of potential hazards. With that said, let's dig in a little deeper. The first part of the parable has a wise man building his house on a rock. The word used for rock is Petra, which when translated is rock, cliff, or ledge, meaning it ain't no pebble. Remember bedrock? The first thing that came to my mind is an ancient city of Petra found in Jordan, which was carved out of a sandstone monolith. This place has appeared in, let's just say, a few famous movies. Basically, the city was constructed by the Nabataeans in 310 BC as a trading outpost in the desert. The city was located about 150 miles south of Amman and Jerusalem. One interesting point about Petra is that one of the major water sources was possibly the place where Moses struck the rock twice in anger against the Israelites grumbling about no water. God punished his actions for that because he was supposed to speak to the rock. Instead, he struck it. Of course, that doesn't really seem to apply to the parable, but something else might. Look at Matthew 16, 18. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus then goes on to tell Simon that his name is changed to Peter. The name given was Petros which means rock or stone. This would be an object that you could pick up with your hand. He goes on to say that upon this rock or Petra, I will build my church and not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. Interestingly, found out that when Jesus said this to Peter, they were near Caesarea Philippi, an infamous place of pagan worship specifically to Baal or Baal. In fact, the disciples may have questioned why he was taking them there. It was here that he asked them who the people say that I am. He then asked, who do they say that I am? Peter acknowledged that he was the Christ or Messiah. Supposedly, they were standing near a cave at the spring known as the Gates of Hell. Caesarea Philippi, though a popular destination, was not a place of pious one. It is interesting how Baal was a god mentioned over and over in the Bible that Israel would fall away to. And where there is Baal, there is Asherah and Molech. It was at Caesarea Philippi that King Jeroboam built a pagan offer causing Israel to sin. And I've come to realize that these were not some man-made idols. Rather, they are demons or evil spirits who are alive and well still. They demand worship in the most unholy ways, including child sacrifice. Is Baal worship still a thing? Surprisingly, in 2016, a replica of the Arch of Palmyra was erected in a small park in the financial district in New York City. The original arch was an entrance to the Temple of Baal, and was destroyed by ISIS. This arch also has shown up in Washington, D.C., as well as London and maybe other places too. I don't wanna give any glory to Baal, but I ask again, is Baal worship still happening? A frightening example was elaborately acted out at the opening ceremony of 2022 Commonwealth Games. But back to Jesus. Jesus took a stand saying upon this rock, or Petra, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So was Jesus saying Peter was the rock when he said that? That is a big no. Remember, Peter's name was Petros, not Petra. What Peter said was Petra, the truth. Revealed to Peter, Jesus is the promised Messiah. It is the gospel message that is revealed within the heart of the believers 
and that is the rock and the salt and the light. Did Jesus's stand hold though? As of 2022, there are over 2.4 billion Christians around the world. We're not talking about from the time of Christ to 2023. Let's get back to the parable. The word used for house isn't just a physical dwelling. It could also include all that live in the house or property and wealth and belongings. Simply put, every aspect of a person's life should be founded on the message of Jesus. The contrast? The person who establishes all on the sand. You see, sand in dry conditions can be as hard as concrete. In fact, in most mortar and concrete mixes, sand is a key component. However, given oversaturation, sand loses its supporting capabilities. If there is added movement, such as an earthquake, then the result is what is called liquefaction. When this happens, the soil becomes like a liquid and will move to the lowest possible level. Everything that is on that soil will be swallowed destructively and rapidly. With liquefaction, the earth moves, taking everything with it. Whole communities have tragically disappeared in moments because of liquefaction. But back to the parable. The key here, I think, in both scenarios is he who hears these words of mine. The one who does, which could also mean to make or create, will be wise. And the one who does not will also make or create, albeit not on a firm cliff or towering rock but upon potentially shifting sand, and that is not why. So maybe another question is, how does this parable relate to the other two parables told in the sermon? Jesus had several points in his sermon. He started out by saying that you are blessed when you get persecuted, but you are the salt and light of the earth. Persecution can be a real shaking in one's life. It can feel like a horrible storm. The question is when the persecution happens, what substrate is one's life built on? The two parables transition to basically say, if you thought the law was impossible to meet before under Jesus' fulfillment, it's not even close to being possible. Okay, I'm finding pattern here with the reference to the law and meaning of these parables. The law keeps showing up. The world doesn't want the law. And many who call themselves Christians believe that the law is no longer valid. This is not what Jesus is teaching. Anyway, how are we supposed to follow him if it isn't even close to being possible? Well, chapter 6 explains how it is made possible. He starts by saying generosity should be done in secret to the poor and that really there is nothing to worry about because all we have to do is learn to pray and seek God because he isn't leaving you alone in your attempt to righteousness. But if we aren't seeking God's kingdom and righteousness, then what are we seeking? If we are not seeking God, are we building our lives on sand? That is a resounding yes. Matthew 6, 33 says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. This verse starts out with the word but. The word used could also mean moreover, which means more than that. So more than any worry or care in this life, we are to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. But it comes with a promise. That is a huge comfort as Jesus then spends most of chapter 7 warning of hypocrisy. Remember that the sermon was addressed to his followers, which indicates that stepping off into hypocrisy can be done very easily. Then he closes with his parable of the wise and foolish builders. As I think of this, holistic perspective of these parables of the wise and foolish builders, the salt and light, Jesus does not promise a life of ease when we follow him. However, he does promise God's provision in an uncertain world. I want to build upon the rock, knowing that when the storms rage, I will find security in Christ as well as being pleasing unto him.